Sandor. This is Mauna Loa, past, present, and future. I'm from Live Wolf, Hawaii, Kaihui, and today we're going to be talking about Malama in the Marshes and field ecology and research on Oahu. Um, we have Marty Kawasaki joining us today from HCSU. Do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, sure. So uh, I grew up on Oahu. Um, about uh, 15 years ago, I moved to the Big Island for my undergrad work. Um, and in my undergrad, uh, I did an internship in a wetland back here on Oahu and uh, just fell in love with it. And so after about 15 years, 14 years, I came back here um, to start working on a water uh, movement project. So, uh, and I know, Amanda, we met uh, about two years ago when you started working on another water bird project, but, uh, and now you're gonna be working with uh, myself and I know you, I, let me know what, where, let's catch up, like what have you been doing for the past, like what got you out here, because you're a mainland girl. <laughs> sure, yeah. Um, so I started about two years ago, um, my, I had family that moved out here, my older siblings, and I wanted to, you know, I'm from New Jersey, so I wanted to take full advantage of having family in Hawaii and having somewhere to stay and people to hang out with. Um, so I actually came across um, I was looking for something environmental to do since I was an environmental studies student at the time uh, with a concentration in ecology at Allegheny College, um, which is this tiny school in Pennsylvania. Um, and so I came across an ad looking for volunteers for a water bird study with the Hawaiian Gallinule uh, with Charles Van Rees from Tufts University. And so I came out and I, was, I had no idea what to expect and it was just amazing. It was so much fun and um, that's how I got in connection with Libble Hawaii Kaihui. So I was lucky enough to be able to come back this past summer, um, now that I've graduated college and I've moved here. Uh, I've been here about nine months. And uh, yeah, now I'm working with Libble Hawaii Kaihui and working with you in the field and it's been great. Yeah. So uh, do you wanna tell us a little bit about the current project? Um, yeah, so the current project um, is a movement ecology study. Um, the project's called the Movement Ecology of Hawaiian Waterbirds. Um, we have a, uh, a little logo that we made about a year ago. Um, and so uh, it's actually run through uh, the USGS, the, the US Geological Survey, and, uh, a, lot of, and half, a lot of the funding is coming from Navy lands and also the US Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, yeah, that's our adorable uh, ally, I mean IO, um, flying over its wetland, and so that's uh, the current project we're working on is looking at the movements of water birds between wetlands on the island of Oahu. Okay, great. And um, so where about on the island do you do most of your work? So uh, most of our work um, kind of focuses on uh, three main water bird habitats in Pearl Harbor. Although, um, you know, because we're looking at movement, we're very interested in how they move around the rest of the island. So we do have um, towers um, you know, most of our towers are in Pearl Harbor, but we do have uh, a, a couple of towers on other sides of the island. So we have one out in Kahuku on the North Shore. Uh, we have one, or we're going to be putting one up um, in uh, the windward side, so just above the mountain ranges so that it'll cover the three main wetlands in that area. Um, and so that makes up the main triangle, but there are little pockets, um, such as uh, Keawava Wetland and Hawaii Kai, um, and Pico Lagoon out on that side that also have wetland habitats for our water birds. So, um, you know, there's a lot of little pockets of wetland habitat, but we're focusing on those three main um, hubs of population for these uh, three water bird species. Great, okay, and um, so when you, when you catch a bird, um, when you're out in the field, what do you do? Okay, so when we catch uh, the birds, we usually um, take measurements on them. So once you catch a bird, because these birds are critically endangered, um, you don't really get to handle them all that much. So you, you know, we take things like bill measurements, uh, leg measurements. Um, we, uh, you know, we put transmitter tags on them. So, um, so shield measurements, uh, transmitter tags, and. Uh, you know, we also look at the colorations of the birds uh, with the Alai Ke'o Ke'o. Uh, we look at the shield coloration. Um, with, a lot, with the I.O., we look at their leg color and their bill length. Um, and also plumage, you know, plumage differences that we may see with them. Okay. And uh, in a couple of your images, I saw um, yeah. some, they look like little bracelets on the birds. What are, can you tell me oh, about those? Oh, yeah. So those little color bands on the legs are of the uh, I.O., the stilt, 
are actually identifications. So um, say my transmitter tag falls off of, of a bird, so a little backpack that you, the little kind of weird uh, dial and wire you see on the bird. If that were to fall off, um, the bird could still be studied, st could still be located, and its movement could still be documented by citizen scientists that, you know, were out birding, looking at the birds, and they would record, hey, you know, I saw this bird with this, you know, weird, you know, orange over something shiny, green over s blue, or some whatever the color is. And that would be that bird's specific identification. Because when they don't have leg bands, these birds all look the same <laughs> um, for the most part. OK, cool. And uh, what are you looking for when you do get data or someone, you know, someone tells you, I saw this bird out here? Um, what are you looking for in your data? Uh, so what we're looking for in the data is how these birds are using their habitat. So how? Well, one, how they're moving around on Oahu. So why, why a particular wetland is, is important to them. So, these, so again, a lot of the wetlands we're working in are protected areas. Um, and in these protected areas, you know, what are the managers doing there that are promoting these birds to go there? So we're looking at why birds are staying in an area, and then why are, are they moving from place to place? So that's part of, you know, leg banding helps us determine that. Um, but, you know, these birds aren't always in their core habitats. They're sometimes flying to new places. So that's, you know, why potentially a golfer that sees a bird at a golf course maybe could report a bird to us and be like, you know, as, or, or to Fish and Wildlife Service, to any state agent, to any uh, biological agency in the state of Hawaii to say, hey, you know, I saw this bird with this weird color, you know, with, with bracelets on it, as, as you said, with bracelets. Yeah. And that information could get back to me about how a bird that maybe I banded in Kuhuku on the North Shore ended up maybe in Keawaawa or Paiku Lagoon on on the Hawaii Kai side. Hmm. Okay. And um, so you mentioned also that they have the little radio tags. How can you tell me a little bit about how they work? Yeah. So radio tags. Um, we have uh, receiving towers. So we have these uh, towers that we have at our core wetlands or in uh, areas that we consider flybys, uh, where if a bird is present, the tag will be picked up. And so they're radio tags. So it's kind of like the radio dial in your car. Um, it switches between different frequencies, and these tags are coded by number. So if a bird were to get picked up at my receiving unit at a particular wetland, it would record a timestamp when that bird was picked up. And so with that, I can determine, you know, how long it takes a bird to fly from one habitat to the next, or how long a bird is staying at a particular site. Like if it's there all the time, that bird lives there. That's its house. You know, that's, <laughs> it's a homebody. It never leaves. It has everything it needs at that one wetland. Whereas if I have a bird that moves where there's patches of the timestamp that are, you know, empty, that tells me that bird is going somewhere where we don't have a tower and where, you know, I need to go and try to find it because it's using another habitat that, you know, we don't know about. And so it could be another, a new habitat, a new wetland that nobody knows exists or somebody knows it, it exists, but they're just keeping it a secret. So these secret wetlands are also very important to um, our movement study. Okay, great. So like a a secretive wetland might be Cave Ava, where it's kind of in this really developed area. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. So that's the kind of thing where that data is really interesting to me. Right. Um, is seeing little funny areas like that where you might not expect it. Right. Where you might not expect a bird to, to be at or hang out at. Yeah. Definitely. That that's the kind of thing we're interested in with this study is adding on these secret pockets of wetland habitat or these pockets of wetland habitat that you know aren't necessarily noticed or not. You know, it, it's it's not that they're not noticed. It's not. It's just that it's not advertised. The birds are not advertising. We're always going here, and so with that, that's that's where citizen scientists calling up, letting us know the birds are there, or having a tower in a location like Keava Ava, or on a, on top of a ridge line, so it could pick up uh, the coastal area as mm -hmm. well. Okay, and uh, how do you get more towers for your project? So the way we get more towers for the project is. Um, Easiest answer is funding. Um, uh, agency buy-in is another one. So we do have some interest from the Division of Forestry and Wildlife to purchase a tower. So usually that's what it is. Is it if an if somewhere if a land manager or an agency is interested in having a tower on their property, 
um, we provide them the information that they can go and purchase the tower and we help them set up the tower for them in addition to um, tagging birds for them because that's the other half of it is, you know, you have a tower and you're interested in what birds are coming into your habitat. But, you know, you're also, you know, a lot of people are interested in where their birds are going because they see their birds and then, you know, maybe there's a, what, there's a storm event and, all, and their birds leave. Where do their birds go? And so we were seeking to answer questions like that. Okay, cool. And what kind of, what results have you seen so far with the towers and the tags that you do have out there? So um, the results we've been seeing um, with our towers is, um, I think I have some like graphs that I brought for you. Um, okay. And so these, uh, what we're looking at, oh, so this one uh, with this particular coot, um, you can see what I was saying about how we have birds that don't really move all that much. And yet there's this one event where it goes to another marsh. So green is where it stays all the time. And then it switches over to this blue color for a little bit of the month of August. Um, and that's probably because uh, during that season. And so like with this guy, you can see he's pretty much at his main wetland and all of a sudden he's bouncing back between uh, two, different ha two different other wetlands. So a hua reef and um, Hono Uli Uli when it was a bird that was always at Waiava wetland in, um, in the Pearl Harbor area. So these are, and so, Again, this is a fun one with a stilt where you can see this bird likes to stay out of Hua Reef, but it has these pockets in the middle of the day where it's going somewhere where you can see we have tag. It is getting picked up at some of our wetlands, but there's these holes in, in, in its time, in the time stamp where it's not at these wetlands. So it could be somewhere in between these areas that maybe there's a golf course, there's a watercress farm, or there's other habitat in between being home where this bird goes to. So when this bird goes to work, I guess it goes somewhere else. And then, you know, again, a bird that bounces between two, ho two homes, um, Hono Uli Uli and Pohala. And then again, in the middle of the day, like clockwork, it's somewhere around Ahua Reef, Fort Island, where it's not getting picked up. Now, unfortunately, Ahua Reef and Fort Island are fairly close to the Honolulu International Runway. So this kind of information is important because, you know, if we can get some interest from the Honolulu International Airport to want to look at birds crossing the runway, this will help us um, answer the question of, you know, in the middle of the day, is there a wetland close to the runway that we don't know about? Is there a golf course around there that these birds are going to? Because you can see it's... Uh, a Hua Reef, again, is fairly close to the reef runway. And so is it somewhere over there? And so that's, you know, kind of what we're focusing on this year is these, um, these holes in our data and trying to fill them in with reciting birds and having citizen scientists um, or just anybody in, in the island of Oahu's community keep an eye out for birds that look like they have um, a wire sticking out of them. And it's really with the stilts because they... When, when you see a stilt with an antenna sticking out of the back end of it, it's, it's very obvious that that is a very long tail feather, and those birds don't really have that long of a tail feather. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a little obvious. Yeah, okay. And so you're, you're looking at why they're moving, where they're moving, how they're moving, um, just all these different aspects, and you're getting all of that from your towers. Yeah, we're getting, well, we're getting timestamps from our towers mm -hmm. is what it is. So we're, we're understanding when they're moving. Mm. with the timestamps. How they're moving um, is being answered by, well, you know, we look at um, tide flows or storm events. Like there's a couple of wetlands that are only fill up when we have these huge storm events in Oahu where it's a mud flat that is usually dry for the majority of the year. And then what, during our winter months when we have those big rain events, it fills up. Pohala wetland is one of those wetlands where, you know, it's dry and then all of a sudden, like when we have these big rain events, so, you know, if this is Pohala when it's dry and then when it rains, it fills up oh, wow. and it's, yeah. you know, you can see the very, the difference of it. And there's all these stilts that show up there. And so these are areas that, you know, when we have these big rains, we have these large movement patterns of these birds. So um, that's something that, you know, we're checking out. Hmm. Okay. And so you're saying that the stilts, um they kind of change their location with the tides. Have you noticed um, something similar with the coots and the gallinules? Like what trends would attract them to a certain area? 
So what trends would attract a coot or gallinule to a certain area um, usually depends on the vegetation in the area, like when, so you saw how um, one of our wetlands, uh, Wyava, um, is very, you know, is open, it has uh, a large pool of water, uh, which is, you know, that, so, you know, we have, this, we have these large pools of water with like little islands of habitat, and so that's something that coots like. Uh, stilts love these like large mud flat areas. So you see in the foreground of the photo, there's these large mud flat areas, and if you look behind it, there's these large ponds. And so that's what really attracts uh, coots. They're they're very they love open water. They love tiny little islands that they can dry off on. Whereas gallinules um, like it, you know, they like open water, but they also like tall sedges. And so uh, tall vegetation like bulrush or like uh, our native sedge, uh, makaloa, is another thing that they really like to nest in. And so they're very hidey birds. They'll go and they'll, and they like to be in the reeds and stuff. So that's why Keava Ava wetland has this habitat. It's a, and it's a very small scale, but it has that habitat that these um, Hawaiian gallinules, the Alaiula, really prefer. Um, and you know, Alaiula also are freshwater birds. Any sort of change in the salinity could affect them to leave a wetland. And the same can be said about the Hawaiian coot. They like fresh water, but they'll tolerate slightly brackish, slightly salty water. If, get, if the salinity gets too high, they just, they pick up and they fly. Okay, and stilts aren't really so much about the salinity, stilts they don't aren't, mind. Yeah, stilts aren't so sensitive about it. And it's because, you know, they forage on tidal mudflats. So when we have those low, low tide events, um, you know, in the Pearl Harbor area, when I go and I sample birds, I'd like to go during low tide because I can easily find a bird out on a mud flat because they're long-legged, they're very visible birds. Um, they're very easy to track in that way, very easy to identify with their leg bands. Um, so that's, the stilts aren't really tied to salinity or, or anything, except that, you know, if there's a high rain event and you know, a, a place that is usually dry, no water, fills up with water, that adds a new food source that they're not usually getting. So that tends to attract the stilts to a new wetland or a new um, location for foraging. Hmm. Okay, and um, so we've talked a little bit about tides, we've talked about vegetation. Um, as far as human behavior, I know you had said that uh, you've worked a little bit on golf courses where you've seen these birds hanging out in the water features mm -hmm. and then you've also worked in places uh, like James Campbell Refuge where it's very uh, restricted access for yes. the public. Have you noticed anything different about the birds like personalities or behaviors? Yeah, not, not to get too anthropogenic on it, but you know, you would think that the birds that are in these protected wetlands where they don't see a lot of people would not pay any attention to us because they're like, oh, well, that's, you know, somebody new. They're not used to, like, humans being predators or humans chasing them. And so you would think in a protected wetland, they're not going to be too sensitive about a person walking around. But I find that those birds are the most sensitive. Those are the wildest, wildest birds, whereas the ones that you see on a golf course, I guess because they're always interacting with people on those golf courses or in urban environments like Hamakua Marsh or Keava Ava, where they're regularly interacting with with humans, um, they really don't care all that much about a person being in an area. They just kind of see you and just go about their business. Like some, I, it, it, it's happened before where I've you know been surveying on a golf cart and like had to slow down because a stilt or a coot or a calanule, um was too close. I mean, they definitely notice when you're in a golf cart and then you take out your binoculars and you're, you know, really looking at them very hard. You know, they have that prey aspect to them where they're like, wow, you're staring at me for a really long time. I'm going to pick up and leave. Mm. Yeah, and especially when you pull out the binoculars, so your eyes are suddenly huge. Yeah, your huge. eyes are so yeah. suddenly huge. Yeah, yeah, it definitely changes them. That would probably freak me out if I was a bird, too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and so when you're at the golf courses and you're, you know, you're surveying these birds, um, they're gener generally like pretty skittish for all of the species or is it a little bit more um, like gallinules versus coots? I mean, they all definitely have their level of fear and their level of reaction to fear. Like stilts will um, tend to walk away from you. 
a coot, um, depending on if it's on a water's edge or if it's, you know, out in the open. Like a coot um, loves to be in the water. Like that's how it evades pred predators is if it's in the water and it sees you, it's just going to stay right there because it knows it's safe in the water. It can, it can swim a lot faster than you can on that water. A stilt, again, will like just walk away from you, probably run away, maybe take to flight. Um, Gallinules run. <laughs> um, and, you know, they have these like long toes, splayed toes that they just like, they can take off like a, a star track athlete and just bolt. Um, and again, coots have these like little webby toes where they just like take to the water. And so um, the fear response is that uh, stilts fly, coots swim, gallinules run. So that's, that's tend to, that tends to be the response to fear. Hmm. Okay. Um, does their behavior change at all uh, throughout the year? Is there a time when they're more, um, more aggressive or more shy? Um, speaking for the stilts, mm -hmm. um, because that's where I have a lot of my, I mean, I'm just starting to get to know the, the coots and the gallinules a little better. But speaking for the stilts, um, they definitely have uh, a seasonal aggression and that is uh, during their breeding season. So during nesting season, when they have tiny little baby birds, that tends to be when they are the most aggressive towards anything. Any other bird, humans, mammal, mammalian predators, anybody can get struck by, by a stilt in, during that time. Hmm. Um, with the coots of the gallinules, they tend to have aggression against each other. So, um, you know, it's, it's all about protecting your babies. And that's something that, you know, I've, I've, never, I've never seen, I've never heard of a coot or a gallinule chasing down a person um, because they've gotten too close to a nestling. In fact, um, they tend to, it's, it's been my experience that um, gallinules tend to be a little bit more baggy. So mm -hmm. they'll actually come and approach you for food if, there have, if, they, have, if they have nestlings or uh, chicks. Hmm. Um, I'm not too sure what a baby gallinule is called. I, I, I'm just going to call it a galley. So <laughs> they have little galleys is when they get um, a little bit more needy. And I've actually seen them when, you know, you, you're not supposed to be feeding them. But when I've seen uh, people feed them, they'll take the food back to their chicks and feed their chicks. Like, oh, you know, I tested this out. This is actually pretty good here. You, you try some. <laughs> yeah, I want my little galley to experience this. Yeah, I want my galley to have some of this. <laughs> That's really interesting. Um, what would you say the biggest issues or threats are for these bird species? Uh, so with them, I mean, the biggest, biggest threat for them, especially in these, because their wetland habitats are so small, that's the main thing, is that they're very limited by how much habitat there is on the island of Oahu. Like, really, the entire coast of Oahu used to be wetland. I mean, that's just how it naturally was geologically. And with the changes of, you know, development from us, developing coastal areas like Waikiki and, you know, even the Pearl Harbor area, parts of uh, the North Shore, parts of the Windward side um, being developed, a lot of those wetland habitats have been um, reduced or severely uh, affected um, by, the, by the introduction of invasive species. So really it's, um, how much habitat is there. That's really what it is, is carrying capacity of a wetland really affects these birds, followed shortly by, you know, probably invasives. So invasive plants that they're not used to having to nest in and, and invasive animals that are starting to prey on them. And even some of their native uh, predators can impact them. Um, and then with our water use, you know, we have our aquifer that we're drawing from and there is a saltwater lens. And so um, as we're consuming more water, these birds are having less, that, that lens gets lower and lower to the point where, uh, you know, if there's fresh water on top, the way, you know, hydrology works, if there's fresh water on top, at some point there's not enough of a lens where the salt water comes up through that lens and you have saltwater incursion into a freshwater pond. And that could definitely affect the Hawaiian gallinule and the Hawaiian coot. Hmm. So these are, you know, and so, you know, malama means to care for. So by caring for the marshes, so by, you know, supporting uh, restoration activities like the ones going on in Keava'ava um, by the Hawaii Kaihui to um, 
promote more wetland habitats. You guys are actually doing really great work by helping sustain that population of gallinules. Now, um, if you guys do too good of a job, you guys are going to have more gallinules and more water birds coming in there, which for me is exciting. But as land managers, I'm not entirely sure if that's if if you guys want to go that far. I mean, obviously, it's excellent if you do. However, you know, it, it adds another element because you guys are um, you man you're managing for Hawaiian gallinules, but if you have Hawaiian coots come in, then you have to create a little bit of a corner that's coot habitat so that the coots have somewhere to go and they're not competing with the gallinules because yeah. they will compete with each other for resources. Yeah, that's absolutely true. Yeah, um, it's yeah, it is interesting that you say that. You know, we're here talking about Malama, and um, that's how I came on with Libble Hawaii Kaihui was uh, started just as volunteer leader. Um, so for our second Saturdays every month mm -hmm. where we do the restoration um, of Keava Ava and we work to make it better habitat for the gallinules and mm -hmm. um, you know trying to attract more birds come our way um, and just really keep that area livable. Um, it's that's how I came on was just leading volunteers and then it turned into um, helping with this grant project that we have from World Wetlands Day 2017 to 2018 mm -hmm. uh, World Wetlands Day. Um, so yeah, that's definitely what we're trying to do is just restore it and um, Malama the Marshes. Yeah. <laughs> so I really want to thank you, Marty, for coming out and talking with us about birds and about what you're doing out here. Um, it's been really interesting hearing, hearing from you and getting to know a little bit more about what you're doing. Well, thank you again, Amanda, for inviting me to speak to you. And I'm very happy um, that you're progressing in your wetland um, knowledge. Thank you. This has been great. Thank you guys for joining us on our episode today. Uh, again, this is Mauna Loa Past, Present, Future, and um, it's been great. Thank you.